There are few mercenary units in the history of the Inner Sphere more storied and with greater impact than the Grey Death Legion. Though never a gigantic organization, Grayson Carlisle's mercenary company's influence has been felt far beyond any battlefield or planetary system. Their discovery and subsequent spread of information from the Helm Memory Corps may have ended up completely changing the trajectory of mankind. While this video isn't on the mercenary unit itself, it is important to contextualize why it's necessary to give credit where it's due, especially when discussing the history of Inner Sphere Battle Armor. When the new Avalon Institute of Science was ready to put their first battle armor into testing, top-tier Lyran units were chosen as well as the Grey Death Legion. You might ask, why would the Lyrans trust a mercenary unit with such technology? It was due to the fact that without the Legion and their discovery of that Star League memory core on Helm, the battle armor as well as dozens of other military projects, would have likely been stuck in research and development for many years. The Grey Death Legion was a particularly wise choice for the testing of battle armor as the Merc unit was already well known for their use of mixed arms. The new battle suits would be put to the test in a wide variety of conditions and working in tandem with standard infantry, vehicles, and battle mechs. While feedback was accepted on the performance of the battle armor designs, the skilled technicians within the Legion understood that bureaucracy can often move at a glacier's pace. While recommendations and requests for modifications, the battle armor designs could take months or even years for a response, they could make changes, often in the field, to tailor the technology to the unit's needs. By the end of 3051, the Grey Death Legion was fielding two unique variations of the standard Inner Sphere battle armor, a heavier suit that was relatively close to the standard and a much lighter trimmed down version intended for scouting and infiltration missions. As time passed, the number of variants and their divergence from the official Lyran designs continued to slowly grow. Today's video is about those variants and what they can bring to the battlefield. Adapted for their use in conjunction with conventional infantry, the Grey Death Standard Battle Armor is intended to provide the user with enough protection, strength, and firepower to take on vehicles, hardened positions, and even battle mechs. At 1,000 kilograms, the GDS is classified as a medium armor, and it has many of the features we've come to expect from an inner sphere design. It can move at a swift 32.4 kilometers per hour, which is quite good for a battle suit. It can keep up with jumping elementals, which had to be a consideration for the Grey Death Legion, which faced down the Jade Falcons on multiple occasions. There are no jump jets, unfortunately, but that is common with these earlier battle armor designs. In the left arm, the GDS has a battle claw, and an anti-personnel weapons mount. On the right, a modular weapons mount. The first production runs could carry the following. A small laser, a flamer, a machine gun, an SRM-1 with four shots, or a light recoilless rifle. While the GDS lacks the jump jets and a modular SRM that Clan Elementals carried, it still helped to shift the balance on the battlefield a little further away from ridiculously unfair. One gem that's sometimes overlooked is the GDS's sensor package, which provides the user and the battlefield commander with an additional plethora of information. And of course, we all know information is ammunition, right? In the Grey Death Legion's conflict with Clan Jade Falcon on Pandora during the fifth wave of the clan invasion, the Grey Death standard battle armor performed well, and it's widely reported that it contributed substantially to the overall victory against the clans. As the data continued to roll in, production of the GDS was ramped up, and the Grey Death Legion even began building their own suits on Glengarry. The continued advancement of their in-house technicians and scientists would serve the Legion well. Though the Grey Death Legion would not survive the Battle of Hesperus II in 3065, the tech-savvy unit's scientists, engineers, and techs were too valuable to see scattered across the stars. Defiance Industries extended the resources necessary for the creation of a new company named Grey Death Technologies, or GD Tech, Research, design, and production would remain on Glengarry, and this new company would continue to produce the standard battle armor, as well as two other designs we're about to get to know a little better. Along with the Grey Death Standard, engineers saw the need for a lighter suit for scouting and infiltration. By late 3051, a functional design was ready for field testing. What it was, at the end of the day, was a stripped-down standard suit that had pulled off much of the armor from the heavier design and replaced with Molt Scout Armor. The battle armor's weaponry was also pulled in exchange for a 250 kilogram active probe. The suit's claw was replaced with a fully articulated hand, which could grip equipment or get through buildings at a more swift pace. 
The end result was a scouting battle armor that offered less than half of the original suit's protection, had no weaponry, but could provide a bountiful harvest of valuable battlefield intel to field commanders and other soldiers. That's not too shabby. Oh, I forgot the best part. Though the user can only travel at a brisk 10.8 kph, the suit is packed with powerful jump jets which can carry it further than the standard clan elemental. At 4 MP for those playing the game at home, the Grey Death Scout armor is a very mobile scout at an incredibly low battle value cost. The first use of the Grey Death Scout armor was against the continual nemesis of House Steiner and the Legion itself on the world of Pandora. Using the regional jungle terrain to their advantage, Legionnaires put the scout suits to work as force magnifiers, locking in locations of Jade Falcon units for artillery and guiding forces into weak points in the Falcon advance. In conjunction with the Grey Death standard suits, standard infantry, armor, and battle mechs, the Falcons were punished on every step of their way. The scout suits were even able to participate in the fighting by placing satchel charges in vulnerable leg actuators after leaping from concealed positions. At least two Falcon mechs were disabled from their efforts outside the town of Vandermal. Though never produced in great numbers, the Grey Death Scout suit was invaluable for its purpose as a forward spotter, scout, and general annoyance to mech warriors who wanted to believe that a mech could remain an unchallenged master of modern warfare. Even after the death of the mercenary unit on Hesperus II, Grey Death Technologies continue to produce the suit for the Lyran Armed Forces, as well as for other mercenary units. This is good news if you want to incorporate the Grey Death Scout Armor into your forces. The other design I'd love to get into is the Grey Death Heavy Battle Armor. I say I'd love to, but we really don't know enough about it. There is art for it, which you're seeing right now, but specific details beyond its creation date in 3083 are few and far between. We know it had a top speed of 21 kilometers per hour, lacked jump jets, and weighed in at 1500 kilograms. It had standard armor, which offered 10 plus 1 protection from enemy fire, it kept the basic manipulator from previous designs, had improved sensors and carried a support PPC along with two detachable SRM-4s. I've scoured the PDFs I have looking for information on this, I am just coming up short. If you know where one might go for more history on the GDH, please let me know in the comments below. Now our last two entries in today's collection of Grey Death battle armors aren't technically created by Grey Death Technologies, but the first developments were, and their influence is obvious on the designs, so I'm going to go ahead and include them. You can't stop me, this is happening. Take a deep breath, you're fine. We're all fine, this is, this is fine. The Grey Death Strike Battle Armor is a medium suit weighing in at 1,000 kilograms and designed to provide several key benefits to the battlefield commander and the soldier wearing it. Though it lacks jump jets, the GDS can travel on ground at a swift 32.4 kilometers per hour. Once it gets where it's going, it can use its detachable SRM-3 pack twice before detaching it and becoming even more nimble. For close quarters fighting, there's an anti-personnel mount which can carry the standard variety of weapons. Finally, on the right arm, the GDS has a light version of the target acquisition gear, which can be used to spot artillery and long-range missile fire. The armor protection is a decent 9 plus 1, with a human-like basic manipulator on both arms. The suit is compact and can navigate around urban environments easily and carry light items including satchel charges to where they can self-actualize in the knee joints of enemy battle mechs. I bet you didn't think I could work in Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs into the Battle Armor video, did you? Yeah, welcome to the Thunderdome. The Word of Blake years were unkind to Grey Death Technologies, and damage done on Glengarry rendered the production of Battle Armor, even the older designs, impossible. Defiance Industries stepped in and took control of the company, which included relocating the remaining GDT assets to manufacturing sites on the planet for Relo. Though new battle armor would eventually be produced, there was a considerable delay as they, as well as the rest of the Inner Sphere, recovered from the kerfuffle. The first prototypes of the Grey Death Strike armor had all the bells and whistles. Armed with Clan Tech short range missiles, it would have been a very potent fighter. Unfortunately, Defiance was unable to obtain access to a steady supply of the Clan technology and had to redesign for the standard SRM 3. It came at the cost of downgrading the suit's two battle claws to those previously mentioned basic manipulators and a reduction in the supply of SRM ammo. That would have been pretty awesome to see the original advanced design in action. 
Maybe there will be an L Clan update to this design coming our way that can make this happen now that Clan Seafox is rolling around tossing Clan tech around like confetti at Mardi Gras. By 3080, the Grey Death Strike was ready for full production and the assembly lines on Ferrillo were rolling. Field tests and deployment yield positive results on the GDS's performance. While users did complain about the lack of reloads for the SRM and not having a secondary weapon beyond that single anti-personnel slot, Battlefield commanders were quick to put that tag system into good use. Reports from those who had to face the GDS in battle included descriptions of just how difficult to target the battle armor was with its compact size and swift running speed. In the years following the collapse of the Word of Blake, the Grey Death Strike was built exclusively for the Lyran Commonwealth to resupply their stocks of battle armor. Rumors from within Defiance Industries suggest that a number of GDS suits were also being retained by the company for their own defense forces. Some of these may even have been the more advanced original versions armed with the clan SRMs. True or not, production numbers didn't meet with deliverables with the Lyran Commonwealth, so those extra suits were headed somewhere. As it stands, the Grey Death Strike would be a powerful addition to a larger battle armor formation. Specifically, Fenrir suits armed with LRMs and the standard Interstellar battle armor, which can carry the knockout punch following the GDS's missile barrages. Our last entry into the collection of suits from the lineage of the Grey Death Legion is also the newest. The first of the Grey Death Infiltrator suits rolled off the production lines on Ferrillo in 3102. Classified as a medium armor at 1,000 kilograms, the GDI suit reflects the storied lineage of all the battle armor designs that came before it. It's flexible, speedy, has jump jets, and can fill a variety of roles on the battlefield. Put simply, it's exactly what the Inner Sphere needed to fight the clans a century before its creation. Sorry. The Grey Death Infiltrator can run at a speedy 32.4 km per hour and can match the jump distance of your standard clan elemental. It can also be equipped with a parafoil to allow for guided airdrops. Though it doesn't have a battle claw, both arms do have basic manipulators. The right arm is equipped with a David Light Gauss rifle with 15 shots, which can put the fear of a divine creator into the target quite quickly. In the left hand mount, a variety of equipment can be added, including a Fire Drake support needler, light tactical acquisition gear, there's your tag, improved sensors, a remote sensor dispenser, and six sensor packages, and even a mine dispenser that can carry a pair of mines. This flexibility provides a lot of options for the unit and for the battlefield commander. The Grey Death Infiltrator can operate as a scout, a support unit, and even has a decent enough basic stealth armor for a stand-up fight with 7 plus 1 protection and that David Light Goss rifle. In one of their first uses, the Grey Death Infiltrators in the hands of the 10th Lyran regulars were airdropped onto the surface of Glengarry in order to disrupt a Jade Falcon garrison which was preventing the escape of a lance of Lyran Battlemax. The factory complex at Ipswich was defended by Falcons in Ironhold Assault Battle Armor and standard unaugmented Salama troops. Landing on the roof of the factory, the Lyrans were able to spread out and infiltrate the factory buildings. The unaugmented Falcons fell quickly to the GDI's weaponry and physical attacks, but the Assault Class Ironhold Battle Armor represented a much more significant threat. A few were taken down through the use of TAG and Arrow 4 strikes, but the rest of the Ironholds had to be swarmed. The Battle Armor LBX autocannons and AP Goss rounds punished the Lyran forces, but eventually the last of the Ironholds were taken down. Only seven of the GDI units survived the fight, but that win ended up saving that lance of 10th regular battle mechs, so it was considered a win. Particularly effective against light infantry and vehicles, the Grey Death Infiltrator is very likely to be a common sight as the Lyran Commonwealth seeks to lick its wounds from being run ragged by both Clan Wolf and the Jade Falcons in the run-up to the Ill-Clan trial on Terra. Time will tell, but I could easily foresee it replacing the standard Intersphere battle armor even beyond Lyran borders. It's been a blast to dig into the history of the Grey Death Legion produced and influenced battle armors. Of all the groups that have thrown their hats into the ring to create battle armor in the Inner Sphere, it would be difficult to find a non-government military organization that was more influential than the GDL. Thanks for watching. Don't forget to hit all the buttons so that YouTube knows the video is worth sharing with others. The list of battle armor topics that people have requested is continually growing, so who knows where we might end up next. Plus, there's another Periphery Faction video on the horizon. Big thanks to the channel members and Ko-Fi subscribers who are going above and beyond to directly support the channel. 
AdSense is basically nothing when you have 6,000 subscribers, so those memberships go a long way in making this project start to make sense. I really appreciate it. Until we meet again, take care, go make the world a slightly better place today and tomorrow.